is the essence of Dzogchen. Nature of mind. To summarize the first three chapters, if we're now on four, yes? The first three chapters say, go find your mind. Just that. None of this will make any sense to you if all you see of yourself is your thoughts, which you're always listening to, your feelings, which you're always feeling, and your sensory perceptions, which you are always experiencing. If that is the totality of your life, doesn't it kind of get tight and old <laughs> sometimes to have nothing but that constantly in the turmoil of this and that that you feel happy, angry, sad, scared? Constantly interpreting sensations in the six sense organs with stories of this and that, talking to yourself about those interpretations, and then have feelings about what you said to yourself, and going around in circles doing that again and again and again, like forever. Does this sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> this is the box that we live in. 100% of our attention is focused on what we experience through our six sense organs, the sensations, what we think about those sensations, how we interpret those sensations, and how we feel about the interpretation. When someone bumps into you in a crowd, you feel someone touch you against your body. Pickpocket, clumsy person distracted and stumbling, sexual advance, too crowded here, I hate crowds. You see all the possible ways and right in the moment of feeling that, you will interpret it according to your past experiences. If you have been a beautiful young woman for a while, you're gonna automatically assume somebody's trying to grow. If you are not a beautiful young woman and haven't been one recently, <laughs> but you have had trouble with thieves or had your pocket picked in the last year or two, your mind's gonna to go to pickpocket. If you have been off in retreat or living out in the country, your mind might go to, I hate crowds. Whatever it is, you will immediately, without hesitation, tell yourself a story about what just happened. And then you will experience an emotion based on that story. That story has nothing to do with any externally existent reality. The story you tell is all about you. The emotion you feel is all about the story, not about the sensation. This is the box that traps us in a lifetime, in a thousand lifetimes, in eons of circling and dithering and circling and dithering. Never knowing what's really going on, never responding to the moment that's occurring, never even seeing the moment that's occurring, only seeing our interpretation of a series of sensations. Now, some of you who are close to my age may have had a period in your life of drug use, uh, uh, psychedelics. Remember when you're tripping how you say to yourself, even if it gets weird, well, I'm gonna come down eventually? 
<laughs> so that when it gets weird, it's like, okay, it got weird, but I'm going to come down tomorrow. It'll be okay. You're not coming down tomorrow. You're stuck in this until you find a way out. Trapped by your attention. Rigpa. The seer, rig, the verb to see, pa, the er suffix. In Tibetan, rigpa is the seer. Your rigpa, feel it. What's looking out from behind your eyes? Right now, don't name it, don't talk about it. Experience it. That's your rigpa. Look over here. That's your attention. Your rigpa is not the same thing as your attention. Your rigpa perceives according to where you pay attention. Your attention comes and goes. You, the seer, the ability to see, the awareness that experiences, is always present, experiencing regardless of what it's experiencing. However, we don't identify with the seer. We identify with the story. We identify with the limitations of our attention. <coughs> Your personality. Yeah, yours, whatever it is in this moment. It's a story. You are, personality-wise, whoever you think you are right now, and I assure you that will change. A cup of coffee changes it. Drugs change it. Biological dineural rhythms change it. Blood sugar levels change it. And we hate ourselves when it changes in ways we don't we think poorly <coughs> of. And we love ourselves and, lo and think we're wonderful when it changes in ways we think highly of. It's not you. It's moving, it's changing. In order to actually perceive the meditation of Zogchen, to perceive the nature of mind, you have to, with your attention, close your eyes, open your eyes, look at the altar with your eyes. Your attention has followed your eyeballs. Now look at me with your eyes. You see how your attention moved? We're going to use attention as a tool. But the problem is, your mind is in not in one of the ten directions. So, you won't find it by looking over there, <coughs> or there, or there, or there, or there. It's not to the left, the right, in front, or behind, or above, or below. But everything that you are usually obsessed with is. Your lover, your car, your clothes, your money, your mortgage, your problems are in one of those directions. Your mind isn't. So I cannot point with my fingers. I can only point for you with words. In order not 
to be trapped in paying attention to what people think of you meditating. Whether I think you are good or bad as the Lama, whether you think you are good or bad or all these other weird personality craps which you're going to have to like put down for a while, <laughs> the antidote is bodhicitta. It is the opposite of self-focusedness. When you are looking at yourself and thinking you're better than or worse than, they've been mean to me or they've been nice to me, I like, I don't like, I need, I want, I don't need, I don't want, go away, come here. When you're busy doing that, it's all about you. <coughs> Bodhisattva is not all about you. When we say, arise Bodhisattva in your heart, we're talking about kittens. The Tibetan word for Bodhisattva is <coughs> Ninji. Any of you, um, Sangha, speak Tibetan a few words? Ninji. It's not compassion, it's how you feel when you hold a kitten. When you hand a Tibetan a kitten, a cute little fluffy kitten, say, oh, Ninji. It doesn't mean they feel sorry for the kitten. It means holding the kitten made their heart go, ah. Ning, heart. G, greatest of, most expanded, highest, most superlative. Ninji. Kittens. <laughs> One of the ways of arising that feeling is to imagine, depending on whether you're a dog person or a cat person, a kitten or a puppy here on your heart. And it licks your nose. How's that feel in this chakra? That's the feeling of your heart expanding. There's like a long ache. That's the closed bud of the lotus chakra blooming into Ninji. Every life form, every bug, every bird has once been a puppy in your arms, has been your baby, trusting you implicitly. Let your feeling towards the puppy expand to pervade the universe. And in Ninji, your hate, fear, want, comparative, jealous crapola <laughs> just sort of <coughs> falls off. Feel that? So all teachings and all practices begin by arising bodhicitta. Personally, I like kittens for that. It's a chakra thing, a feeling, a tsalung thing. It's not telling yourself I'm a good person because I'm nice to others. That is not bodhicitta, that's self-focusedness, the opposite of there are methods like Tong Len and certain Genrezig practices that make it open faster and stay open more. Someday you can request those, not today's teaching. <clears throat> but you gotta do that first if you're gonna meditate. Because you can't really get your attention to open wide while your heart is all scritched being protective. Can't start with kittens. <laughs> puppies. Personally, for me, it's possums, actually. I had a baby possum. <laughs> I found it. It was a little more than a fetus, and I bopper fed, bottle fed it, you know, with a dropper, and I raised it here. 
because they're marsupials. They need a pouch, and this was the best I could do. It was really cool going into Starbucks and things, and there'd be a smell of cookies, so he'd poke his head out of my car. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be just standing there ordering coffee, and his flippy the eyes, and my hands are so long, and those are really deep. Coming up out of my cleavage going, <laughs> steal from garbage cans and climb trees and naturalized him in the streets of Oakland, which is where he came from. So. See me in the neighbor's garbage cans trying to teach my possum how to talk. <laughs> hey, he didn't have another mom. It was up to me. You can love anything, even a dirty rat. experience freedom, you'll have to experience it from your long body. Everything you ever was or will be. Which is everything at all. I'm being infinite. From that relaxation, take refuge in the teacher, the teaching. And those who walk with you on the path, Buddha Dharma Sangha, Lama Yidam Khandro, Sa Lung Tigli, Chuku Longku Truku. Without attempting to tell yourself stories about what this means, my homies, not your homies, or Sangha. My <laughs> Lama looks like this and has squinty eyes because he's Tibetan. Leave it alone. Take refuge in the infinite open awareness, which is the ultimate Bodhisattva Buddha consciousness, and figure you'll eventually know what that means. Because, see, it's inside of you, not outside. Your own natural mind, ground of mind. There where your thoughts be happening. <laughs> where your own damn feelings be happening. Where you be perceiving your perceptions via the six sense or <coughs> organs and coordinating those perceptions into an experience. That's your mind. But it is not just the things which arise in it. It is also the infinitude of that in which they arise. So there's three teachings. Teachings of the body, teachings of the speech, and teachings of the mind on how to find your mind. Yes, I'm taking you through a real quick nundro again. Some of you haven't been here last time and haven't had it. Align your channels. Whether you sit in the Maitreya position or a lotus position, it is necessary that your back be straight. If you try this cact, you're not only going to hurt yourself, but you're not going to see it straight on and clearly. Consider the importance of form in archery. If you don't stand right, you'll never hit the target. Therefore, align your channels, symmetrical on the two sides, back straight up and down, chin ever so slightly tucked, so you don't have a big sway back here. If you have scoliosis, do the things that you need to do to settle that to the best it can. And if you don't know what those are, check with your physical therapist. 
It's different for everybody depending on which way you curve. Your tongue sits comfortably with the tip just behind your front teeth and the sides slightly between your teeth. This is because you must not shut your teeth. Important. You also don't completely shut your lips. Important. Even though you are predominantly breathing through your nose, your mouth is relaxed with your jaw loose. It makes a difference. There's channels that run from behind your front teeth and through your tongue. But the eyes are the key. The eyeball position is what's most important. Remember when we looked at the altar, we paid attention to the altar? Mm -hmm. You cannot look at something with your eyes without paying attention to it. Try, pick something in the room, look at it without paying any attention to it. See? Your attention follows your eyeballs. Us humans are connected that way. It's neurological. Yes, there's a few people who are blind and have, then their attention follows their hearing, which is harder to aim, so these teachings would have to be modified. But in general, Tibetans are all visual. <coughs> what you're gonna do is let your eyeballs find the natural up and down place and the natural point of focus, which is usually for most people, more or less an arm's length in front of them and slightly down. Uh, mine is right about here. Find that place with your eyes half open, half closed, half masked. And then let go of the focus of your eyeballs. It is extremely important that you unfocus your eyes. Therefore, those of you who wear glasses will find it extremely easy to unfocus your eyes by taking your glasses off have an advantage. When you can't see, they lose their focus anyway. With your eyes unfocused, like back when, remember in college when you got a boring professor after pulling an all-nighter and you're sleeping with your eyes open and your eyes are looking pointed at the professor but they're crossed, kind of not looking really. You see two and then it gets all blurry. Do that with your eyeballs. Let go of point focus. You see, your mind is not a point. You cannot see it with point focus. It's too big. So you're going to have to release your habituated point focus, which is usually focused on what you are thinking, what you are feeling, and what you are perceiving. eyes. And with your attention, you gently, softly, and relaxedly look past what you are thinking at where your thoughts are happening. Mind you, there is no there to that there where. And yet, the seer sees itself. Infinitely open lucidity.
awake, but not pointed. This is called open awareness. When it is truly open, it is all encompassing awareness. Slowly over time and practice, as you relax again and again, more and more, into open awareness. The infinite vastness and utter emptiness of mind itself. Beyond the realm of thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, the very thinker, feeler, and perceiver itself as it always has been. For the thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, commonly called phenomena, come and go. They are the moving. They dance about, they arise, and they vanish continuously. This awareness, wide open, without ground, Unborn, undying. It is your own mind where your thoughts arise and vanish. It is not a big dead old nothing. Vital and alive. With the vitality of its clear light nature, also known as Sambhogakaya nature of mind. And that vitality, that very clear light of vitality, which pervades the infinite open awareness, filling the entire universe and all universes and beyond time, and bigger than space. That vitality itself is lively with the playful laughter of Nirmanakaya, which is itself the very dance of your thoughts and your feelings and your perceptions, which arise in awareness as awareness and dissolve in awareness. Nothing changes. Instead of looking through a pinhole, see the whole damn thing simultaneously. This is where samsara and nirvana are the same. This is where your energy channels, the chi within them, and the life uh, and the lively essence of Tigli's. <coughs> arise as the dance of form in matter, as formless no thing. This is Svabhavakaya, Dharmata, where there is no separation between infinite open awareness, its innate vitality, and the liveliness which that gives birth to. To recognize this in its entirety is called Tawa. To recognize it again and again like practicing archery each time coming closer to hitting it straight on, each time expanding the orifice of your attention a little further, a little further, until it encompasses the totality of yourself, which ain't no self anyway. This is meditation. 
and allowing the liveliness of the vitality of open awareness to dance as it will without attempting to herd it into one form or another. This is SOPA, the spontaneous non-action of action. Emma Ho, again, my beloved sons and daughters, gather round and listen. During all the analysis and examination of your minds, in the manner described previously, where you kept looking to see where your thoughts would be happening again and again, trying to find it, searching for it, with the same desperation you look for your car keys in the morning. And you failed to find a single thing that you could point at and say, it's that or it's this. Because really, this is where the this and that don't happen. There is no thingness there. Thingness is a limitation. A thing is this thing, not that thing. No limits, no boundaries. When you fail to find so much of an, as an atom you could call concrete, your failure was the supreme success. To sit with your channels in alignment, your muscles relaxed, the instructions of the speech are simple, just shut up and stop talking to yourself. Your speech in silence, and your mind, your attention, open, expanded as much as you can from your usual point focus of paying attention to phenomena. Bigger. And each time bigger. First, mind itself has no origin. It is originally emptiness and openness, utterly insubstantial. Look at your mind with your mind. It's not made of paper or wood. It's not made of flesh or atoms. arise in the limitation of whatever languages you are able to speak. Thoughts dissolve as if they never had been. Like writing on water, there is no thing here to leave an imprint on. Insubstantial, as the great Yogi Gilan Gurdji always said, and you can't even sit on it. <laughs> Second, it has no location. <coughs> it is not in one place more than another place. It is not in front of you, behind you. <coughs> inside you, outside you, to your left, to your right, in your head, in your toes. In China, on Mars, everywhere and nowhere. This is why you need to practice. Practice is the key. Everybody talks about practice. Relaxing your awareness, your attention, wider and wider, opener and opener, until you are utterly able to perceive the totality of things. 
not what you're thinking, how you feel about what you're thinking, or what you're thinking about that you saw with your eyes or heard with your ears or felt with your skin. in emptiness as emptiness and dissolve in emptiness as emptiness as do feelings and perceptions it has no color no shape there is no roundness squareness tesseract no red or blue or white even when we speak of the luminosity and the brightness of it, we speak of the characteristic of transparent light, not white light, not woo-woo, oh my, your jaw falls open and your eyes bug out light. Pure, clear, transparent light, like is here between my hands. Nothing to see. And yet there is light, for if I place an object there, the light reflects off it and you see the object. The light itself is completely transparent. This is clear light, though. Don't be thinking of the lights you saw on window pane. <laughs> it does not move. It does not come and go. When you are utterly in a funk, which we all get as sentient beings, funks are a chemical thing. <laughs> so when you're in a funk, it didn't go away. What a funk is, is where you got your orifice of attention all snared down into a really sharp thing. And anything it looks at, it pokes unpleasantly. Anybody been in a funk recently? So remember how you did that? It's really tight and narrow, isn't it? Open awareness is the opposite of funks. But it doesn't mean never funk. <laughs> <laughs> Your attention will move. You cannot keep your orifice of attention constantly expanded. Because all things which move always will move. You're not going to stabilize the moving, Mahamudra. <laughs> your attention moves. Look, pay attention to that. Now pay attention to that. Look, it moves. So don't be thinking you're going to train it to stay still. <laughs> Not going to happen. Oh, yes, Shine, you can train it to stay still for a while. <laughs> but even with the best Shine of the Buddhas, your bladder will win in the end. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to get up and go pee, no matter how good your Shine is. And the moving will continue to move. Let your confidence rest in that which does not move without shoving away or rejecting that which does because that which moves is not separate or other than that which does not move. Your thoughts move. What are they made of? Open awareness. <laughs> the totality of yourself, open mind, tawa, the view, dharmakaya nature of mind, doesn't move. Follow your thoughts home. Look at that infinite openness with your mind's eye. And you'll find that you can't look at it like this through tunnel vision and squinting. You can only look at it like this through openness and relaxation. Be looking at where the thoughts be happening. 
and you will eventually notice that although the thoughts move, that there where, which is utterly open and insubstantial, which the thoughts arise out of and dissolve back into, it don't move. Keep looking at it until you notice. Return to it again and again. This make more sense for you? Questions? In case I'm leaving anybody behind, yes. Some uh, yogi with extreme uh, city powers decides that he doesn't like you moving your Maha Mudra and decides to. Uh, doesn't like me moving my Maha Mudra? No, me. I'm talking about me. Okay, but you. What What are you moving? Well, I'm just being in my natural uh, train and journey of life, right? Yeah. And now with the Maha. This, this is where I'm getting. Maybe I'm, I don't know what Maha Mudra is. I probably Okay, don't. let's not use that term. Use other terms. Okay, I think okay, it's I'll not the more term. Just, I'll just be frank about it. I'm like, okay, so suppose I'm going towards the right. I'm doing whatever God tells me to do. There's a lot of demonic voices kind of going around telling me all this untruth stuff. So I have to sort through all that. Hopefully I won't think one of those is God. And then, you know, so I'm going to the right. And then this yogi guy who's like 96 or something, who doesn't want to die comes along and says, you go to the right one more time and I'm going to kill you. What do you do? See a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> For that kind of circumstances, I would go me. see a doctor and look into medications. <laughs> okay. Best I can suggest. Okay. So everyone in the room heard that? Yeah, I'll be going down to Emmeline, so don't block me next time. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, Rigpa versus Dharmakaya. Can you differentiate yes. somehow? Yes. Rigpa is what's looking out from behind your eyes. Right now, your Rigpa, your awareness, has a habit of paying a narrow pointed attention to this and that. Okay? It has never really been able to relax enough to see itself not in the totality of itself, or you'd already have turned into a rainbow and disappeared. <laughs> and you're still here, we're talking with us, so. True. So that's Rigpa, the seer. <laughs> Dharmakaya is the infinite open awareness, which is an aspect of the nature of mind. Mind itself in its totality has three aspects, but there are three aspects of the same thing. Lama Lena has robes, earrings, and occasionally farts. These are all aspects of Lama Lena. They're not, you can't, they're not other than me. You can't take them away and without changing me. So the three aspects of mind are dharmakaya, infinite open awareness, stillness, that which does not move, utter emptiness. The innate vitality of that emptiness, sambhogakaya, sometimes referred to as the clear light nature of that emptiness. Light is that with which the seer sees. Awareness perceives because it has vitality, aliveness. Not the aliveness of birth and death, but the aliveness, which is what I have to call in English, the ability to perceive and experience. Sambhogakaya, nature of mind. This is where all the gods are born. That vitality of emptiness is because of its vitality and because of its spaciousness completely lively. The liveliness manifests as thoughts, feelings, and perceptions of all living beings. 
just as the vitality manifests as the aliveness of all living beings. Just as the infinite open awareness manifests as the awareness, the infinite open infinitude of Buddha consciousness, where Sunyata and the Bodhisattva are the same. Did that answer your question? Yes, they're devices to point. But Vipra is not really different than No, it isn't. It is a talking about a different side of it. Rikpa is not different, not separate from and not other than Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, or Nirmanakaya, all called Svabhavakaya, which Tibetans can't pronounce, so it's Dharmata. Because <laughs> they can say that. <laughs> Tibetans don't do Vs. That's how Vajra turned into Doji. I remember my teacher trying to learn to say fork. <laughs> fork. In order to directly perceive this beyond the possibly confusing descriptions of words, you gotta practice. You gotta sit there every day, at least once and preferably a few times, for at least a couple of minutes, preferably five or ten, Shut up, stop talking to yourself and telling yourself all about the this's and that's and what's going on here and what's going on there. Take a deep breath, blow it out through your, your mouth, in through the nose, out through the mouth. Just settle your chi. And relax into tawa. Tawa is the word for opening your attention as far as you can get it so that your awareness settles into its own nature, which is dharmata. Thanks. Now we got it? Other questions? I don't want to leave anybody behind on this one. Bodhicitta being the same as Shunyata. Yes. Wow. I never thought of that. Wow. But. Mm. Wow. But have you got any Paolo Condro, anything in concert? Mm, no. That's the whole symbolism mm. of the union of the consort deities, or of um, Guru Rinpoche, the Katvanga, the spear, is simply a symbol that he has a consort. That's his consort in that picture. Oh. That's a stand-in. It is the symbol of the union of infinite open awareness, the female aspect, the yin aspect, the all-encompassing aspect. Great Ocean Mother of Dharmakaya. And the young Pawo, dance of form, loving dance of form, where all the forms in the universe mate and interpenetrate with each other and separate again. Bodhisattva and the dance of Bodhisattva. And yet it is emptiness in emptiness and open awareness.
awareness. Yes, in the back. No, oh, I'm leaning forward. Without him, there would be no um, cost-prohibitive effort to unify parity and integration on theory and quantum, right? Do you understand what I mean? You do not have to put forth effort to unify them because they were never separate in Zogchen. If you don't find that to be so for you, then you should do Tantra for a while. Most people, who, most actual practitioners, intermingle Zogchen and Tantra. They do some Tantra and some Zogchen. Very few people do only Zogchen or only Chogchen. A few, my teacher, for much of his life, but not all of it, are really just totally into Zogchen. And then he got back into Tantra later. Okay. They do the same things. But Tantra is more goal-oriented. You get somewhere with it. Zogchen innately acknowledges <laughs> the isness of Buddha nature. Both are true. One of the problems with this damn English and Germanic languages <laughs> is you can't say two completely opposite things and have them both be true without conflict like you can in some of the Asian languages. It's not linear. Your language is linear. The universe is not. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any others? So where does, um, which comes first, the thought or the energy to get into the... What energy? So the, oh, it's... I don't know what you the mean energy, by the word energy. The energy of, of this around us, the energy of our channels, because the, it's... Cause You're talking about the innate life force in the universe? I'm talking about what makes us think, like our attention, so it's our stories, so it's like... Which comes first, the energies, like our, our channels of like our, our habitual, how our channels run? You no, know, but there's no first and second here. Okay, that's why I was wondering what, yeah, okay. Your pogchas, which is how you habitually have your channels running, your karma, within time, within time, there was no beginning for time began outside of time. And each moment is both the first and the last moment of time. However, to our linear perceptions <laughs> who feel and believe that we must move only in a certain way along a line in time, which frankly, guys, no, you don't have to do that. You can do all sorts of shit once you stop believing in that. <laughs> However, you were raised to believe in that, and it will be hard to let go. <coughs> mm -hmm. Your own nature, your mind, the totality of mind, semi, real mind, big mind, doesn't come and go. It's always there. It is vital. That means it is capable of feeling, thinking, and perceiving. That vitality is often referred to as its clear light nature, symbolically, because it is by light that we can see. Without light, we can't see. The awareness is the seer. So that awareness, its ability to be aware, is symbolized as Sambhogakaya nature of mind. The act of being aware, which involves the thoughts, feelings, and perceptions occurring in each moment, 
is symbolized as nirmanakaya nature of mind. These are not separate things. Dharmata svabhavakaya is one thing which is infinite, open, awake, aware, and playful. And Arolpa, the play of the nature of mind, the play of all Buddhas, the play of the Dharmakayas, Chukuropa, is phenomena. You had a question. Of what? Chanting. Chanting. Oh, chanting. Well, we don't usually just chant Om, but chanting, different purposes depending on the circumstances. One, sometimes it's used as Mon Lam, wish path. If you say something often enough, you come to believe it. Usually, we cast nasty spells on each other and on ourselves. How much time do you spend going around saying, I'm so fucking stupid. I'm such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. That's called putting an X on yourself. That's bad mon lam, bad wish path. <laughs> Affirmations, as was the style maybe 10, 20 years ago, back in the 80s. That was casting a nice hex on yourself. Same thing, more juju. So sometimes we use recitations like Parchi Lamsam, uh, the removal of hindrances, to repeat again and again certain monlam, they're not prayers to a god. We don't do gods. The Tibetans don't have gods, not the way the Westerners have them. Ain't no gods. Not that way archetypes we have. These are archetypes. They're symbolic representations of your own mind. They're not up there being daddy. Of course, we have land spirits, which are like another kind. The demons and land spirits and worldly gods are all the same kind of critter. I digressed. We chant for a couple of reasons. Sometimes we chant when we're totally freaked out and we're shaking and we just got to calm ourselves. That's a time to do Oma Hong, Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya in symbolic seed syllables mm -hmm. until you can stop shaking and deal with whatever it was that's got you shaking. <coughs> Sometimes we do it to set an intent, Mon Lam. Sometimes we do it to make a baby go to sleep. If you chant manis at a baby, it goes to sleep. If you got two people who are just always fighting, you chant a lot of manis around them, it tones it down. So if you find yourself, if you're, if you're a kid and your parents are fighting all the time, and it's, got, it's getting to you, you just always just the smooth manis. You keep giving them the manis, giving them the manis. It sort of settles, it drops the energy. Did that answer your questions of some of the different reasons why we might chant? Well, it seems to me like the negative chanting works more, more effective than the positive. You do it more. <laughs> but I don't see, I don't know, you know, people, those people that chant, it doesn't seem to be helping them. To me. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Um, I don't know what they're chanting. I don't know why they're chanting it. So just like I can't really address people I don't know and what they're up to. <coughs> There's an awful lot of teachings out there that do not have a long lineage. They are experimental. Like any experiment, some of them will probably work and some won't. There's a lot of made up stuff, including chanting. People chant some of the weirdest stuff. There's all sorts of made up um, mindfulness meditation where mindfulness is the goal instead of a tool. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't have any long-term lineage. It's like taking a newly invented medicine. Risky. Might work real good. 
might work real bad. Might kill you with side effects. Don't know. I like old stuff. Tried and true, tested for a couple of thousand years. I prefer aspirin to a cyclophenic. Willow bark is even better. Did that answer your question? Well, I don't know who you're talking about. I haven't told you to chant. I have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. I'm just saying it doesn't seem to be very effective. Well, then don't do it. Pick <laughs> something that you think will work better. <laughs> I really can't address the other stuff that I don't know enough about. Exactly. Didn't study it, don't know. Other specific questions? Yes. I just um, thought I heard you say you called Tantra Chagjen? No, that was ma that's a Tibetan word for Mahamudra. Okay. Chagchen and Zogchen. Oh, can you explain what that is a little bit? Mahamudra? Yeah. It's another method of coming to perceive your own mind. Mm. It's primarily taught in the Kargyu lineage. Uh, Naropa, Tilopa, Mula, Marpa. Um, I have the teachings on it that were given privately by the 16th Dalai Lama. No, I'm sorry, the 16th Karmapa, the big guy, to my teacher Wangdor Rinpoche in private, uh, which he passed on to me. And it does the same thing as Zogchen, but by a slightly different method. Um, it's a little bit more linear in its beginning approach. If y'all want Mahamudra, if I taught Mahamudra down here, tell me. If y'all want it, you get to request it some weekend. Glad to do it. It works better for some people and worse for others. It goes the same place as Ochen in the Galug lineage which is Oma Chembo, which is Majumika philosophy. There's a method there. I only trained for a few years in Majumika, so I don't consider myself a master of it, but enough to know it goes to the same place. Uh, Mahamudra goes there. I have not had any of this training in the Shakya line. I know among the Vaughan, their Zogchen goes there very directly. There is no there there. However, Mahamudra, Mahaati, which is Zogchen in Sanskrit, and Majamika are all very different methods that get to the same point. They're ways of pointing. They're fingers. That's a bell. This is a finger. Won't ring. I don't care how long I shake my finger, it's not going to ring, however much it points at the bell. <laughs> Only the bell will ring. <laughs> Mahamudra, Mahaati, and Majamika. And I'm sorry, does anyone know the Shakya word? It may be Mahamudra, I'm not absolutely Lamdre. certain. Lamdre. Hmm? Lamdre. Lamdre. Lamdre is the Lam is path something, dre is, what does dre mean? Fruit. 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 Okay, path of fruition, long dre. That would make sense then. Uh, so they all do a little differently. I have not had at all the Shakya one. All I've had is Tantra and Shakya. <coughs> Whereas I have had this in Nyingma, Karvu, and Vaughan. And Galupa, the Amajamika. So, does this begin as a sort of scholarly thing to tell you what all these words it's mean? It's fabulous. Thank you. That's just what I needed to hear. Good. Yes. Very briefly, what would be the primary difference between the Chagchen, Zogchen, and Mahamudra? Would the Zogchen be meditating? Chagchen, you do this first, then you do that, then you do the other thing. In Mahamudra. In 
result and you jump right into the middle of the lake <laughs> off the deep end <laughs> and it's right there. So there is more of an approach. In Dzogchen, we do have uh, Longde and the Rushens, which are kinds of Nundros. But we always give you the just jump in first. And only when that doesn't work do we come back and prescribe a personal <coughs> Rushen, Nundro, according to how you got yourself stuck not getting there. So it's not a one-size-fits-all like the Tantric Nundro. And it doesn't have numbers like 100,000. Sometimes it has times, like how many days. It's a couple of things in there that are used as method that have numbers. But it's, that's uh, Zogchen. In Chagchen, there's an approach within, uh, sorry, in Mahamudra. There's an approach within it that takes you nicely, gradually, starting with a little pebble and working your way up to the totality of it all. And it's got a step one, two, three, four, five. Zogchen doesn't. So for those of you who want step one, two, three, four, five, you'd probably be a lot happier with Mahamudra. <coughs> for those of you who are frustrated by excessive order, Find yourself to be a somewhat chaotic personality and tend to rebel against instructions, you might do better with Sokja. Majya Mika is really good for those who actually believe their intellect and can't stop. <laughs> That, not Mahamudra, did I say my meant um, <laughs> Majumika? Because it actually uses, it, it works on a computer. If you had a sentient computer, you wanted to get enlightened, get it enlightened, you would probably use Majumika. <laughs> it ties your thoughts in a certain rather circuitous knot that leads to, oh fuck. <laughs> is very effective that way. <laughs> For those who have a scholarly bent. Other questions? I have that feeling myself. Times, you know. Yeah? Oh, fuck. Probably like Majamika. <laughs> Surprisingly, one of the best and most concise Majamika books I have ever read certainly not the only one, is Secret Oral Teachings of Tibetan Mystics by Alexandra David Neal oh, yeah. in French. It's really better in the original, but you can read it in English. It is a very beautiful and concise, short treatise on, on uh, Majumika. Nicely done, nicely translated. Does Lama Yeshi have anything out on that? Anybody know? On Majumika? You know, he's got on Tantra and some of the Tsalung practices. No. If he does, he'll say it in an understandable way because that was his great ability is to be understood. Yes? Rule of the door in Java. It does what you're speaking about, just walking it. Until you get to the top, where there are lovely, this is the story of the Buddha and all of the people going along and all of the historic things. And then, you know, you get folks inside of shrines going up and up. And then they, at the top, there's, there are shrines that no one is in them. <laughs> <laughs> like. Wish somebody was in the mood to plan a field trip for us to go there. <laughs> Love to give a teaching over there in Java. If it ever happens, it'll happen. It's a great teaching. That sounds like a wonderful place that I've not been and would love to go. Other questions before we go on? I want to talk 
talk a little bit about your homework tonight. While I've got your attention before you all drift off into we're almost done. There's a reason I teach this slowly. You can't eat it fast. You'll get emotional indigestion. You'll freak out and become depressed. In an attempt to entertain yourself so that you don't see the totality, you will be extremely creative at having emergencies, heart attacks, clinical depressions, <laughs> amazing fantasies, gods and demons, people attacking you. I don't know what you personally will make up, but it's pretty amazing what I've been known to make up in my own path. Go slowly. If you start noticing that you are manifesting crap to be entertaining so you don't have to go any further <coughs> and you are distracted from practice, anybody know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> Back off. Don't push it. You'll hurt yourself. Back off. Take your practice down to one circle of Om Mami Padme Hum, or even of Oma Hum, a day, until you feel better and then start again. You know what I'm talking about, those weird, crazy interferences, because if you push against them too far and you don't just sort of step back and let them dissipate, you can really do yourself a mischief that you won't be able to get past easily. It's all Jen's not safe. It's no safer than Tantra, sometimes even more dangerous. And the big danger is what you'll do to yourself to keep you from practicing it. Homework. Sit. Just sit. Five, ten minutes tonight. Five, ten minutes in the morning. More if you can, but at least that much. Sit with your channels in alignment. Shut up. Open the orifice of your attention. Follow your thoughts home. Instead of listening to what you are thinking, which is your habit, let your awareness open and relax into the where of which <coughs> those thoughts are arising and vanishing. Do not follow the thoughts. You will find that if you don't follow a thought, you will be in a state similar to almost free association. Right before you fall asleep at night, as the day begins to fade away and the pictures start, but they're not making sense and you're not in them yet, remember how relaxed that place is? So it's like that, except that instead of picking a picture and diving into a dream, which is what we do there, or picking a thought and following it into a story, stay there. In the relaxation which allows the thoughts to arise and vanish without your paying them, no, never mind, but without rejecting them or making something bad out of them either. See, if you push them away and try to stop thinking, you're going to be giving them too much attention. I think I should stop thinking. That's a thought. <laughs> so let them be of peanuts and pollywogs. Don't try to get them to make sense. Leave them be.
eyes are not closed. They are not focused on a thing. Your attention is not closed. You are not sporific. <coughs> you are awake. You are alert. But it is wide open. not critique it. Please. Do not be, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? I must have done it wrong. I never understand it. Please, that won't help. That will happen sometimes. It'll come up. Like thoughts of ducks and tiddlywinks. Understand the homework. If you cannot do that, you cannot find that point of open awareness, which is not a point but an infinite openness, then think in pictures, placing your mind in free association. So you imagine in your mind's eye a ball seashell, an umbrella, a flower pot, a fire hydrant, a songbird. And each of these pictures, as you arise them in your mind's eye, see if you can look through or behind the picture at the mind's eye not at the picture. Instead of focusing your attention on the pictures, focus your attention on where the pictures are happening. You who are musicians can do this with sound. Imagine a song. Hear it with your mind's ear. Is the sound. Open your attention from the song to the where of which you are hearing it. This is a nundra. This is a form of, is it lunde or semde? Probably this would be the beginning of Semde, the transition between Longde and Semde in Dzogchen terms. And this is the Rushen, that what I just taught you is a Nundro, a Rushen, out of the text Yeshi Lama, and it is the inner mind Rushen. You can do it with tactile. Imagine the sensation of burlap or velvet. Where's that sensation? Follow it home. These are methods of finding your mind. When you find it the first time, you'll be looking at it like instead of a pinhole, you'll probably have it about to here. You got to get it open 360 degrees mm -hmm. all around. Mm -hmm. So that's the practice. Each time you look, it's a little bit, mm -hmm. your orifice of attention is a little bit bigger because you've relaxed a little more. So I've given you two forms of the homework. If you can, just relax into natural <coughs> mind and sit there. If you find that that's not happening for you, do the entry practice to it, which I just taught you. Questions on this? Yes. Well, 
Well, I, I'm, I'm curious about the sensation one. Because I've never heard of that. and I, But it kind of resonates with me. So Give it a you, try. Yeah, so would you just come up with different types of fabric? I mean, where would you go after? Cold birth? water. Oh, anything. Uh -huh. Tactile sensation. Okay. Imagined, not real, or happening. Yeah. Where do you feel that? Find your mind. Because yeah. it's sure not in your fingertips. Is that kind of a way of grounding yourself? Too? No, this no. is a way of opening your attention to your mind from phenomena. Okay. We have two kinds of phenomena, inner phenomena and outer phenomena. Inner phenomena are your thoughts and feelings. And outer phenomena are your perceptions. As in, I perceive this cup of coffee as if it were outside of me. Actually, however, I am experiencing it through my sense organs of sight, touch, smell, and taste. And I am interpreting those sensations as a cup of coffee. The sensation plus their interpretation is the perception. It's not out there. It just looks out there. I'm actually experiencing it in my mind as a perception. And I have no way of knowing whether it's out there or not. Yes. Forgive me, my question might be a little bit more um, unusual. Sometimes when I think, I'm totally absorbed in it, and it's very relaxing, and I find that my mind is not thinking about anything. And um, I'm just, but I'm completely focused on what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. So my attention is on what I'm looking at. Yes. But then why do I find it so relaxing? I always think it's because, because I'm not you enjoy about it. That could be. Shine is extremely relaxing. Resting in stillness, not thinking. Is that a form of meditation or mindfulness? It can be used as a preliminary form of meditation. But it is not Dzogchen. Or it is a it is the first stage of Mahamudra. where one uses a one-pointed focus. From there, one learns to relax one's focus through certain exercises. First, one focuses it, usually on a pebble. <coughs> the ability to totally relax and focus yourself, you may, I find that there are certain YouTube videos um, that make me stop thinking. That's not meditation, that's zoning out on a video. <laughs> yeah, it's very relaxing. I'm like, and I'm watching somebody blow glass in a bubble. Or sometimes fractals. Moving fractals will do it. <laughs> That's a focus on an entertainment. Shine by itself, if not taken to Lactan, the next stage, is a focus on an entertainment. It's just a empty entertainment. Other questions? Yes. Could you say something about Lactan? Could you say something about Lactan, the next stage after Shine? Lactong is direct seeing. In Mahamudra, you rest your attention in and on stillness, that which does not move. An aspect of Tawa, she nay. Ne is seat or place or powerpoint. She is the root of peace, stillness. She, Ne, is resting in stillness since you have been resting in movement from beginningless time. 
with your entire attention focused on the moving, as if you could only see the manifestation of Nirmanakaya, and there weren't no Dharmakaya or Sambhogakaya or anything else, and all your attention is completely immersed in what you are thinking, what you are perceiving, and how you feel about it all. So you're antidoting that by shifting your attention from the moving to the stillness. That's still partial. That's grasping nirvana and rejecting <clears throat> samsara. It's an exercise, but you can't keep it. Anything with a beginning gonna end. Shine always has a beginning. Therefore, it be ended. From Shine, one carefully separates what is the moving in Dzogchen called phenomena, thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, and what is the stillness infinite open awareness without form, color, shape, or aspect, not coming, not going, unborn, undying. You make sure that you are not fooled by the idea of open awareness, thinking that that's the stillness, because sometimes you have that idea and sometimes you don't, so it's moving. You eventually find what really doesn't move which is not the idea, the words, the perception, the feeling of that, but that itself. That's important. Once you have fully and clearly come to notice what is the moving and what is the stillness, completely, very clear, then the teacher gives you the next step, which leads to Lakdong, direct seeing. I don't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. I wonder if you could say something about um, I don't have a specific question, but Are you thwapping? I'm sorry? Are you thwapping? Thwapping. When you inhale the suffering, yeah. do you strike, pop the bubble of self focusedness of ego? Because you're not popping. You so gotta pop. pop. No, no, you don't pet. As soon as you take it in, before you can even feel it, it touches, strikes the bubble of self focusedness, which is how you feel and what you think about how you feel, yada, 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 and destroys both of them matter and antimatter coming together. All that's left is clear light. <laughs> There's no nothing there to be overwhelmed if you do that right. Don't forget to thwap it. <laughs> it's an important part of Tong Len. In fact, I think it's what Tong Len is for. I've heard that some Westerners have been teaching it without that. Oops. Mind itself has no origin. It is originally and from the very beginningless beginning, 
emptiness, its essence insubstantial. There's nothing there to grasp, nothing there to focus on, nothing there to hang on to. Without location, placeness, color, or shape, it does not move. For there is nothing there to move, nor even any space to move in or time to move through. It is empty of all of that. In order for there to be motion, there needs to be two points in space and something that goes from point A to point B, and some duration during which it does that. Motion presumes time and space. Infinite open awareness is empty of even time and space. Therefore, no thing to move nowhere, no your mind to the pure mind, not the entertainment it creates. Where the entertainment occurs ain't nowhere. Time is a made up construct. You think that all days are exactly the same length. All hours are exactly the same length, all minutes, all seconds, because your machines seem to be interpreted that way. In spite of the fact that you know damn well that a summer was a hell of a lot longer when you were seven <laughs> than it is now. And days used to last forever. The rate at which you move through time is variable. You just have assumed it steady. You live by assumptions. They are part of the moving. Step. Without moving, it disappears without a trace. Its activity is empty activity. Its emptiness, empty appearance. All phenomena arises in mind. There is no phenomena that does not arise in mind. Notice all your thoughts, all your thoughts. All your perceptions. You don't see with your eyeballs. The cones and the rods in your retina send little puffs of chi through your tsa. Somewhere back here is a chakra that correlates that into an interpretation. And that interpretation is your perception. It is empty of intrinsic existence. You made it up. Mind's nature is not created by a cause. Or is it destroyed by an agent or condition? Just as pillars are not required to hold up the sky, so no idea, concept, doing, or being is necessary for infinite open awareness of natural mind to exist. It did not begin once upon a time, nor does it end once upon a time. For it is not upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> it
It is a constant quantity to which nothing can be added or taken from. Kata, primordial purity, your innate, complete, unfuckupableness, the symbol of the white scarf you offer. Kata, you can't fix it, and you can't harm it. All the time you are trying to fix everything. You itch so you scratch it to fix it. You're hungry so you eat to fix it. You notice that there's something out of place so you move it to fix it. You have a desire so you put forth effort to acquire the thing of the desire to fix it. <coughs> All phenomena requires fixing. All phenomena is mildly irritating. <laughs> Which is why you keep trying to fix it. You keep trying to get all your ducks in the row. Keep trying to complete the to-do list. Do your taxes. Finish the paperwork. <laughs> write the email. Call the friend. Fix it. It needs nothing from you, not even recognition. You need nothing from it, not even recognition. Yar it. Eventually, <laughs> as you relax more and more and the orifice of your attention opens more and more, you will finally come to a where instead of you, the personality, the person, Nirmanakaya, perceiving infinite open awareness, Dharmakaya, nature of mind, vitalized by Sambhogakaya, that disassociation called duality, you will have relaxed and opened the orifice of awareness far enough that you will no longer need to impose duality on your perception. And you will notice that instead of perceiving Tawa, Yar Tawa, pirate talk, <laughs> Yar Tawa. That's a mnemonic, never mind. <laughs> So when you see nature of mind instead of you, seeing nature of mind, which is kind of how it starts when you're first practicing, it looks like that. But whose mind you're looking at anyway? <laughs> whose thoughts did you follow home? <laughs> you are that. You be it. Oh.